Okay, we'd, we'd better, better start. Um, yesterday, we talked about um, elementary reactions as components of chemical mechanisms in combustion systems. Um, and we looked at experimental methods for um, determining the rate coefficients for these reactions. And also, uh, we looked briefly at ways of determining the products in these elementary reactions. And so the, the emphasis uh, throughout the, the, that lecture was on elementary reactions uh, and trying to determine experimentally the parameters that would go into a chemical mechanism that would eventually go into a combustion model. <clears throat> One of the things we need to be able to do often is to uh, understand these reactions uh, because uh, that's going to help us determine some aspects that we can't necessarily uh, uh, obtain experimentally. Uh, in addition, it allows us to extrapolate outside the range of experimental interest. And so one of the things that I want to talk about today, uh, or the main thing I want to talk about today, is the use of theory uh, in a variety of guises to, uh, uh, to try to address those issues. Um, first of all, though, um, just let's, uh, let me show you this reference, which was sent to me uh, at about 11 p.m. last night by Professor Law. Uh, and this is a paper which uh, has just come out in the uh, Journal of Chemical Physics. And it's an analysis of the explosion limits in the hydrogen oxygen system, exactly what we were talking about yesterday. The nice thing about the paper is that it's, instead of just taking a, 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 a detailed chemical mechanism and, and integrating it numerically, is that it, it applies um, uh, analytic approaches. Uh, it uses uh, the steady state approximation uh, to some extent, uh, and also ways of analyzing um, reactions, which we'll look at later, using uh, eigenvalues for the system. Uh, and so I would... Uh, I uh, strongly recommend that you, uh, you have a look at this, this paper. Uh, I will uh, I'll include it in the final, uh, final set of papers that, um, uh, that, that I, I, I give to Lillian. <clears throat> okay, one of the basic central tenets of uh, chemical kinetics and chemical kinetic rate theory is the use of something called transition state theory. Um, and uh, it's useful just to talk very briefly about small molecules and the way in which they behave. Uh, and you'll get much more detail on this <clears throat> if you look at uh, Professor Hansen's notes uh, and at Professor Hansen's lecture. But supposing what we do is we simply take and it's good to see that the board is clean today, so hopefully you can, you can read it. Uh, if, let's take, say, a hydroxyl radical. We talked a lot about the hydroxyl radical yesterday. <clears throat> so what forms of motion can the hydroxyl radical have? Well, it can have translation. And it has three degrees of translational motion. It can move in the x, y, and z direction. <clears throat> It can rotate, and it can rotate like this in the plane of the blackboard, or it can rotate perpendicular to the blackboard. And there are two degrees of rotational freedom. And then finally, it can vibrate. And uh, we can understand the vibration if we look at the potential energy, V, versus this bond distance, R. Um, and let's assume that this is the equilibrium bond distance. Uh, then the potential energy function to a first approximation looks something like that. If you displace the, the atoms from this equilibrium position, there's a restoring force, and so you get a vibration there. 
And so there is one degree of vib vibrational freedom. And so the total number of degrees of freedom is equal to 6. And, that's, and for any molecule containing n atoms, so if we have n atoms for a molecule, there are going to be 3n degrees of freedom because each of those atoms can move in the x, y, and z directions. Three of them are going to be translation. Two of them are going to be rotation for a linear molecule. And three of them are going to be rotation for a nonlinear molecule. And so that leaves 3n minus 5 or 3n minus 6 vibrations. There are 3n minus 5 vibrations for a linear molecule and 3n minus 6 for a nonlinear molecule. And so that's an easy way of working out how many vibrations there are going to be for a particular molecular system. OK, so for example, if we looked at water, there are three vibrations, 3n minus 6. 3 times 3 minus 6 is 3. Three vibrations. There's that vibration where the two h's are stretching out together, and that's called a symmetric stretch. There's this vibration, whoops, where one atom is coming in when the other one is going out. And that's called an asymmetric stretch. And then finally, there's the bend, where these open out and close. OK, so those are the three vibrations for a simple molecule like water. And we can find out about the, uh, there, there, are, there are quantized energy levels associated with each of these vibrations. And in order to uh, know how widely or closely spaced those energy levels are, we use certain parameters which are determined spectroscopically. So for um, rotation, what we need to know is the moment of inertia of the molecule, or the, the three moments of inertia of the molecule, which we can get spectroscopically. For vibration, we need to know the vibrational frequencies. So this is the, the frequency with which the molecule vibrates here, and moments of inertia, I'm sure from mechanics, you all know about anyway. And so those give us the, vi the uh, spacings of the, of the energy levels. And um, so generally, sp and generally speaking, if we look at translational energy levels, we can think of those as being effectively continuous. So the energy levels are so closely spaced that we can think of the energy as being accessible continuously. Then, if we look at the rotational levels, uh, these are more widely spaced. But typically, at room temperature, many of those levels are populated. So many populated at room temperature. Whereas vibrational levels are much more widely spaced. And at room temperature, typically, all of the molecules are sitting down in the lowest vibrational level. OK. one. Final point uh, about, um, about these energy levels is the D 
distribution of molecules. If you take, um, say, the hydroxyl radical and you put it into uh, a, a reaction cell, uh, it will undergo collisions with the bath gas molecules. And these will transfer energy, energy between themselves and the hydroxyl radical. And so what you eventually generate is an equilibrium distribution of those uh, OH radicals throughout their energy levels. Um, so, so even if you start off with a reaction which generates OH uh, with a lot of energy in some particular form of motion, in the end, collisions will promote uh, uh, an equilibrium distribution. And that equilibrium distribution is called a Boltzmann distribution. And the number of molecules in the ith energy level is equal to uh, the number of molecules, well, is, 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 with the Boltzmann distribution, the number, this is given by GI times the exponential of minus EI over KBT. Well, KB is called the Boltzmann constant. T is the temperature, and GI is what's called the degeneracy. This is the degeneracy of a particular level. Sorry, I ought to move that. It's not very helpful there. GI is called the degeneracy. And the total number of molecules is, is really proportional to that quantity there, where EI is the energy of the ith level. And if we want to convert this to an equality, what we can say is that the total number of molecules divided, the, the number of molecules in that level divided by the total number of molecules is equal to this divided by Q, and Q is called a partition function. And Q is simply equal to the sum over all the levels of GI times the exponential of minus EI over KBT. In other words, it's a sum of this term over all of the, all of the energy levels. And so that's an absolutely central equation uh, as far as the distribution of molecules throughout energy levels is concerned. And we're going to use this idea of these partition functions uh, over the next, next few slides. And so we'll come back to, well, we'll come back to that pretty well immediately. Now, let's have a look at this first slide here, uh, which is telling us about uh, transition state theory. Uh, first, first correction is that this dagger had slipped in the notes that I gave you. It was on the AB, but it should have been on the ABC. Uh, and so this is a reaction of, say, atom A coming in to diatomic molecule BC. Uh, going on to form products A, B plus C. So we transfer this atom B from C to A. Or it could be a com more complicated reaction involving larger fragments. And just let's have a look at the energy of this system. So what that's going to look like is, is this. So here's A plus B, C. Here's A, B, C dagger. And here's the products A, B plus C. OK, and this 
entity here is called the transition state. So it's the transition between the, uh, the, the reactants and the products, and it's the highest point on something that's called, the, this thing along here is called the reaction coordinate. And what transition state theory says is that it, it, it's based on, uh, it was initially based on the assumption of there being initially an equilibrium between A plus BC and ABC, and then the use of what's called statistical mechanics. But it's been shown very clearly that that isn't essential, and uh, uh, this sort of expression applies to most of the reactions that we're going to come across. And so it tells us that the rate coefficient is equal to KBT over H, where KB is this Boltzmann constant again, and H is Planck's constant. Q dagger is the partition function for the transition state, so this sort of expression for the transition state, and Q is the partition function for the reactants A plus BC. Uh, and uh, another error in the, in the notes there should be a minus sign here. So this is the exponential of minus the energy of the transition state divided by KBT, uh, where E dagger is in molecular units. Uh, so this is E dagger there. And uh, so, and, and that's in molecular units. And a useful and important equation is that the gas constant R is equal to the Avogadro number times KB. So you can move between molecular units and molar, and molar units by multiplying by the Avogadro number top and bottom. So uh, just let's have a look briefly at this transition state here. What is it going to look like? Well, we've got A coming in towards BC. And um, what forms of, of motion can ABC have? Well, it can translate, it can rotate, uh, but also it has vibrations. And those vibrations are in the form of a symmetric stretch, like that. And uh, if we look at the potential energy surface for this, then it's going to look like a normal potential energy surface. There's going to be a restoring force. Uh, that allows the vibration to take place. There's going to be sorry. There's going to be a bend like this. And once again, there's a restoring force there. So that's an ordinary vibration. On the other hand, if we look at the asymmetric stretch. A is coming in, and C is, go whoops, C is going out. That corresponds to the reaction coordinate. So that's exactly what's happening as we go along here. So that's the reaction coordinate. And what does that potential energy profile look like? Well, it looks like that. There's no restoring force. And so the vibration here is imaginary. So it's an imaginary vibration. And, and that corresponds to this, this reaction coordinate. So um, 
if you do uh, uh, e electronic structure calculations, as, as some of you here do, uh, then your electronic structure calculations uh, uh, relating to this transition state will ret return an imaginary vibration, and that corresponds to the reaction coordinate. OK, uh, so dagger indicates the transition state, the properties of the transition state, and the reactants if spectroscopic and thermodynamic data aren't available uh, can be determined from electronic structure calculations. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm not an expert on electronic structure calculations at all, uh, and so I won't go into them in any detail, but basically you solve the Schrodinger equation for the molecular system that's involved. And, uh, that explains it to all of you, I'm sure. I'm sure you all fully understand what I mean when you say you've solved the Schrodinger equation for this molecular system. Um, but you do, or they, or they do. Uh, theoreticians do. Uh, and so what they can do is they can obtain this, react this, the energy of the system as a function of the reaction coordinate. They can obtain the energy, E dagger, and they can obtain the properties of ABC, its structure, and therefore its moments of inertia, and its vibrational frequencies. And this formulation is something that's called the canonical form of transition state theory. We'll, we'll come on to a micro, so-called microcanonical form later on. Uh, and this gives the rate coefficient as a function of temperature. The microcanonical form gives the rate coefficient as a function of energy. Professor, yep. When you say the vibration is imaginary, does this mean like the solution you obtain when you're solving for that vibration is imaginary? Yeah. Or that vibration yeah. doesn't actually exist? No, the, well, the, the vibration is, is essentially a translation. But when you solve, you, you get an imaginary vibration out of, this, out of the solution. OK, it's, it's essentially uh, that there's no restoring force. And, uh, so it's a construct to say that it's imaginary. Uh, but nevertheless, the electronic structure calculations return an imaginary vibration for that particular mode of motion. These different vibrations here, incidentally, are called normal modes. Normal modes of vibration. And so you may come across that terminology and uh, there are ways of, of, of determining what the normal modes of vibration are for any particular molecule you're dealing with, no matter how complicated it is. Does that answer your question? Um, I, I still, I still just... think, think about it, and we'll, we'll come back to it if you, if you want. OK. A um, little bit of thermodynamics. Uh, what we said is that... Uh, well, this is the expression that we've got for um, k of t. If we go back and look at equilibrium constants, and we'll come back to this again tomorrow when we talk about thermodynamics, then uh, you can show that uh, the equilibrium constant is equal to the partition function for the products divided by that of the reactants multiplied by the exponential of minus delta e naught over kBt where delta E naught is the uh, difference in energy between uh, the reactants and the products. Uh, and we also know from what we said yesterday that that's equal to minus e to the minus delta G over RT. So what we can do is we can use the same sort of ideas here <coughs> to define the rate coefficient in terms of KBT over H times the exponential of minus delta G dagger over RT, where delta G dagger is the Gibbs energy of activation. And as we said yesterday, delta G dagger is going to be equal to delta H dagger minus T delta S dagger. 
And so what we can then say is that this rate coefficient is equal to KBT over H times E to the delta S dagger over R times E to the minus delta H dagger over RT. And this delta H dagger, the enthalpy change, is <coughs> closely related to the activation energy. Uh, and this is called the entropy of activation. And so there's a close relationship between the ratio of these partition functions here and that entropy of activation down there. And we'll use those ideas a little bit later on. <clears throat> Now, um, here's the approach that you use to applying transition state theory coupled with electronic structure calculations to calculate the rate coefficient for reaction. So uh, it's most simple for what is called a constrained transition state. So this is a constrained transition state where there's an obvious energy maximum. And uh, the need to define that will come clear later on. The potential energy surface is then calculated using electronic structure methods and this transition state theory located as the maximum uh, on the reaction coordinate. <coughs> the energy of the transition state relative to the reactants is determined along with the structure of the transition state which allows the moments of inertia to be calculated and the vibrational frequencies. And K of T can then be calculated using transition state theory. <coughs> and we generally use something which is called a rigid rotor and harmonic, sorry, rigid rotor harmonic oscillator approximation. Um, so this here is what the potential energy function looks like for a harmonic oscillator. For real molecules, this isn't, it isn't quite like that. It looks like that. Uh, and the, um, the vibration becomes anharmonic. For a harmonic oscillator, the energy levels are equally spaced. But once it becomes anharmonic, then that spacing is no longer equal. They come, the energy levels become close, somewhat closer together as you go up in energy. But we generally apply the harmonic oscillator approximation, and we also assume that the rotations are rigid. So uh, this, this is like, these two are connected by what's like, rather like a spring, and so as the molecule rotates, the spring will stretch. And so it isn't a rigid rotor, really. Uh, but we generally assume that it is uh, in, in relatively simple calculations. Problems arise with hindered internal rotors and more complex calculations are needed. Uh, so to give you an idea of what that means, supposing what we do is we look at, at ethane, C2H6, Uh, and so here's, there's a carbon atom, there are the hydrogen atoms, there's the bond, and let's now have a look at the other CH3, and let's rotate this CH3 here uh, relative to that one. And if we look at the potential energy versus angle, then the energy is going to be high when these two hydrogen atoms are close to one another because there are repulsions between the electrons. And as we stagger them, so when this H is, is, is lined up between these two H's here, 
the energy will decrease. And the potential energy will look like that as we go round through 360 degrees. So there'll be three minima and three maxima. And if the temperature is very low, the molecules are going to be sitting down in the bottom of these wells, according to the Boltzmann distribution. And so it's, they're going to behave more like a vibration. If the energy is very high, somewhere up here, the molecules are going to rotate relatively freely. But under most conditions, they're going to feel this, poten this varying potential energy. And uh, that's what we call a hindered rotation. So, it, so one, one fragment can rotate against the other, but it's feeling a hindrance potential. And you need some fairly complicated uh, treatments to deal with those hindered rotors. Another issue is what's called quantum mechanical tunneling. And quantum mechanical tunneling is very important in many combustion reactions uh, involving the transfer of a hydrogen atom. So, for example, if we took uh, a simple reaction like OH plus H2 going to H2O plus H, then what's happening is the potential energy surface looks like that, and we're transferring a hydrogen atom from one molecule to the to, from one fragment to the other. Um, and what can happen instead of needing to go over the top of the potential energy maximum, the system can tunnel through it. So it can behave what's called non-classically and tunnel through this potential energy maximum. And uh, so you need special techniques to deal with tunneling. You need to be able to recognize it. And it leads to interesting effects in Arrhenius plots. So uh, the, the effect of tunneling can be that if you plot the logarithm of the rate constant versus 1 over t, instead of getting a straight line like that, you find that at lower temperatures, uh, it curves. And that's because at lower temperatures, this tunneling process is becoming more important. OK, so that's the, the sort of general approach that you need. Uh, and so here are the expressions for uh, rigid rotor harmonic oscillator. The total partition function, Q, is made up of translational, rotational, vibrational, and electronic contributions. Um, Here's the expression for the translational partition function. Uh, here's the rotational partition function, which depends upon the moments of inertia. So that should be I subscript B. Uh, and then the vibrations, which depend upon the vibrational frequencies. We said somewhere over here that the parameterization of these motions is in terms of the moments of inertia and the vibrational frequencies. When you look through the literature, what you'll find, if, if you look at calculations, what you'll find are slightly different quantities defined. You'll find what's called a rotational constant. Which is given the symbol B or A or C. Uh, for, so a molecule will have several rotational constants. And these are given in units of centimeters to the minus 1. And B, and I better get this right, um, B is equal to H over 8 pi squared times the moment of inertia, times c, where c is the speed of light. And for vibrations, you'll find a quantity omega, which is also given in units of centimeters to the minus 1. And that's equal to nu over c. 
So that's what these quantities that you come across as you, if you look through uh, electronic structure calculations and applications in transition state theory, you'll find these quantities there. Uh, so, you, for yourselves, you can convert these into expressions in terms of A, B, and C, uh, and in terms of omega. Um, the electronic partition function is taken directly from this, this standard expression here, um, and it's important in something like OH. If we look at the electronic partition function for OH. So G electronic for OH. There are two energy levels which are quite close together. And the G electronic is equal to 2 plus 2 times the exponential minus delta E over KBT where this is the spacing of, the, of these two energy levels. So there, there are two levels separated by an amount of energy equal to delta E. And the degeneracy of the lower one, G1, is equal to 2. And the de degeneracy of the upper one is also equal to 2. Uh, so if you're dealing with OH, you've got to worry about this electronic partition function. OK, here's, here's an example of uh, a, a rather complicated uh, system that we just happen to be working on. Uh, but here are the calculated data for, for, the, for the transition state with units of centimeters to the minus 1. So we've got OH. So those, there's the rotational constant for OH, 18.59 reciprocal centimeters. The vibrational frequency for OH, 3714.3 reciprocal centimeters. And then we've got dimethyl ether holds uh, three rotational constants in this case, uh, the vibrational frequencies, and then for the transition state. And we finish up with this imaginary frequency that we talked about, which corresponds to the reaction coordinate. And the uh, um, calculation also gives you the energy of the transition state relative to the reactants. And interestingly, in this case, it's minus 0.6 kilojoules per mole. The transition state lies below the energy of the reactants, interestingly. And the potential energy is, is quite complicated. Complica this is the potential energy surface. So the, it isn't a simple surface that looks like this. But there's something before the transition state, which is called a van der Waals interaction. There's a, there's a strong interaction between the reactants, uh, which gives rise to a potential energy minimum that at combustion temperatures has no real effect at all. And then we have three transition states, but they're all linked through these hindered internal rotors. So, so it's a complicated problem, and that's why I put it up to show you that it isn't always straightforward. Uh, but you can, you can deal with it, and you can get a transition state theory expression out. You have to worry about tunneling. And here's experiment and theory. So these are experiments from, from uh, Stanford. There are some of our experimental data down here. Uh, and there's a fit to the, um, the, uh, the data using transition state theory and varying the energy of that transition state. So you've, as, as, as you'll see, you can vary the energy of that transition state in order to get a fit with data. And that's called tuning. Uh, and uh, I'll explain in a minute why it's, it's appropriate to tune. Uh, tunneling is important. And so this is the way the tunneling was done. I won't go through it in detail. But if you are interested in it, there's a, a reference to a paper by Bill Miller, which goes through it in detail. Uh, and these points here are for deuterated systems, so OD. Uh, plus DME and deuterated DME plus OH and OD. And those turn out to be useful in terms of testing the transition state theory. So, so uh, these partition functions change uh, 
These, you can't see the point. These partition functions that change as you go from a deuterated from a non-deuterated molecule to a deuterated molecule. The energies of the system change slightly uh, uh, because of those changes in vibrational frequencies, and consequently the rate coefficients change. Uh, and so this is a good test of the theory, uh, which in this case <laughs> didn't work very well. Uh, uh, the, the, the theoretical values aren't up there, but they 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 don't agree desperately well. OK, uh, microcanonical rate theory. I said that um, uh, canonical rate theory gives you a rate coefficient in terms of temperatures. Microcanonical rate theory gives you uh, uh, the rate at a specific energy. So this is the rate coefficient at energy E. So what we might be doing here is taking a particular energy, I don't know if, can you see that? Can you see that? Okay, we might be taking a particular energy here uh, and working out the rate coefficient at that, let's draw it out properly. Whoops. <laughs> So here's the transition state there. So we may be taking a particular energy up here. So there's the total energy, E. And we're working out the rate coefficient at that point. And the rate coefficient is equal to Planck's constant. There's, there's an error here. That Planck's constant should be on the bottom. So if you could correct that, please, and I'll correct it uh, later on. That Planck's constant should be underneath. Uh, and this is called the sum of states at the transition state. And this is the density of states in the reactant. So what do we mean by the density of states? Well, what we do is we take a range of energies here, small range of energies, dE, and we work out the total number of vibration and rotation states in that small energy range. It must really be in a unit energy range. So that's the density of states. And the sum of states is the total number of ways of arranging all of that energy in different ways in the transition state. So we need to know the density of states and the sum of states at the transition state. So and in order to work those out, we need the rotational constants and we need the vibrational frequencies. If you take this expression and you integrate that over a Boltzmann distribution of reactants, that gives the transition state theory result. It gives you K of T. OK. Let's say a word about the accuracy of these transition state theory calculations. Typically, the uncertainty in the barrier, that should be the uncertainty, that should be in the barrier height is typically for uh, about 1 kcal per mole, uh, this side of the Atlantic. Uh, it's about 4 kilojoules per mole uh, if you use SI units. And what I've done here is to work out what the exponential of E over RT is with E equal to 4 kilojoules per mole. So this, this uncertainty in the energy of the transition state goes into the rate constant through this exponential term, e to the minus e dagger over rt. And so what I've done there is to work out what that uncertainty is. And if we're operating uh, under high temperature conditions, 
then it's really very small. So high temperature combustion conditions, it's not, not a great problem at all, having an uncertainty of, of 1 kcal per mole in that activation energy. If you come down to lower temperatures, if you're interested in working in the atmosphere, though, then the uncertainty is something like a factor of 5 to 10. Uh, and so it, there, it's much, much more significant. Um, there are deficiencies in the transition state model. Uh, in some circumstances, that uh, simple expression doesn't always apply. Uh, uh, I won't go into details. Um, the rigid rotor harmonic oscillator model isn't appropriate in very detailed calculations. And the tunneling model. Generally, you use a simple tunneling model, but you ought to use, uh, there are, are better ways of doing handling tunneling. Uh, improvements uh, can be obtained through higher level ab initio calculations, uh, through variational effects, which we'll talk about in a minute, and harmonicities in the vibrations, uh, multidimensional tunneling. Uh, what we do with the simple calculations is we tune the barrier height. That's the simple way of tuning the theory to agree with experiment, but we try to tune it within the uncertainty, so within this one kilocalorie per mole range. We try not to tune outside that. So here are some uh, examples of very high level calculations. Uh, there's calculations done by John Barker and John Stanton for OH plus H2 using very high level ab initio calculations, including anharmonicity, including uh, um, very accurate tunneling calculations. And, uh, there are the experimental data, and there is the theory, uh, the high-level theory, and it agrees extremely well without any tuning at all. Uh, so, so the, so the uh, theory agrees very well with experiment at this high level. Uh, and this is uh, other calculations for OH plus OH going through a, a series of, of calculations at higher and higher energy levels. And uh, the higher energy levels, they still tune slightly, but the tuning isn't, isn't uh, really uh, significant or important. More complex systems, OH plus CO. OH plus CO is important in combustion. It's the way in which CO is converted to CO2. But it's, it's a remarkably complicated reaction. I won't go through it in any detail at all, but it includes a number of intermediates and we'll deal with intermediates later on. Uh, but these are calculations, again, carried out by Barker and Stanton uh, without any tuning whatsoever. And this is uh, the rate coefficient at high pressures. This is the rate coefficient at low pressures. And the agreement between theory and experiment without any tuning at all is really very good. So, so for these small, this is only really feasible for small molecular systems. So you couldn't apply this to uh, to heptane chemistry. Uh, but for these small molecules, uh, they're beginning to get better and better theoretical calculations, uh, and the agreement with experiment is getting really very good. OK, so what we've talked about there is reactions where there is what we've called a constrained transition state. Uh, so we have a potential energy maximum, and we're certain that uh, the transition state will be at that energy maximum. Uh, and we'll come back in a minute to explaining why we're, we're certain that that's the case. Uh, but let's have a look at some radical radical reactions. Uh, and radical radical reactions. Uh, uh, there is no barrier on the surface. Um, so just let's draw the potential energy surface for, say, CH3 plus H. It looks, well, sorry, that's supposed to be straight. So it, it comes in and forms CH4. So, uh, but there's no barrier on the surface at all. So where do we put the transition state? And this is 
a bit of an argument about what's, what's going on. So um, what is happening, uh, what we need to do is to think about that expression that we had the sum of states divided by h times n of e. And as we come in along here, there are two things that are happening. First of all, more and more energy is becoming available to the fragments as they come in because of the release of chemical energy as that bond is formed. And so, the increase in energy, the increase in the energy available is going to increase this term here. Uh, w, w of E dagger is going to get bigger as we give, as we have more and more energy available to put in to uh, those vibrations. This thing here isn't going to change. We're worrying about this one here. But the other thing that happens is that uh, the system becomes more constrained. The H is coming in. We'll explain this in a bit more detail in a minute. The H is coming in, and there's less freedom in those degrees of motion. And so the energy levels uh, get more widely spaced. Another way of thinking about it, if you would like to think in terms of entropy, the system is becoming, uh, uh, is the entropy of the system is being reduced uh, because uh, it's more constrained. The system doesn't like to be in that region because the motions are more constrained, so the entropy is going down. And so uh, that is going to, <coughs> going to lead to a decrease <coughs> in this term. And the transition state lies at the position of the minimum. in this quantity here. So, so there is these two interactions that are taking place, the increase in the amount of energy that's available, the, and, but also the, uh, the decrease in the entropy of the system because of the way in which the modes of motion are changing. And, and the transition state occurs at that point there. What you can do is you can think of it as a sort of flux through the system. Uh, so, so the react there's a reactive flux through the system as CH3 comes in towards H, and uh, the transition state occurs at the position of the flux minimum. The flux minimum is, is, is where this thing here reaches its minimum value. And that's what this slide here is talking about. Okay, what I'll do is we'll come back to this uh, after the break, but are there any, any questions? Let's use the last five minutes to... Okay. That's, that's I subscript B, yeah. yeah. So... Uh, Yeah, so, so here, this should be subscript B. So that's I A K B T, I subscript B K B T, etc. No, thank, thanks very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Are you brain dead? You don't know. That's, that's a good point. Uh, we, in order to work, and, and this goes back to the issue we were talking about yesterday about uh, <coughs> whether we can use this at equilibrium or not at equilibrium. The uh, provided transition state theory is working, uh, once you go over this maximum, then you're committed to reaction. The system is committed to reaction. 
and it doesn't matter about the products at all. So the energies of the products themselves don't matter, uh, provided they're not higher than the transition state, which is, uh, is unlikely. Um, where transition state theory fails is where, on occasions, you go through this transition state, and something about the shape of the potential energy surface re uh, reflects the system back on. So it, so it goes through and then comes back again. Uh, and so uh, what, you, what, you, what transition state theory does is it calculates the flux through here in the forward direction. And if there's anything that sends it back again, that's going to mean that the rate coefficient you've calculated is too high. Yeah, um, we'll talk about CH3 plus CH3, and uh, uh, I can give you references to papers by Stephen Klippenstein, who shows that there's probably something like a 15% reflection in that particular reaction. Uh, so, so generally speaking, they're small effects, but if you're working, if you're wanting to get very accurate values, then it can be, can be important. Generally speaking, we ignore it. But, uh, but, it, but it can be significant. Uh, so I guess I still, there's... <laughs> I haven't answered your question. You, you did answer that question. Uh, but, so what happens if you can get different products from the same reactants? OK. No, 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 no. Great question. Uh, and and we, we will talk about this later on. Oh, okay. uh, no, no, but, but let me. So, so for example, what, what could happen is that, that as you come out of here, there are uh, two possible uh, um, products that you form. And uh, you've got to have, there you've got to have ways of working out what's going on. Uh, and, uh, and there are ways. I mean, it's going to depend upon the potential energy surface. But in that case, you have to worry about the products. So, so the overall rate coefficient isn't changed. It's still going to be determined by going through that, that barrier over that transition state. But the fractionation between the products is going to depend upon the potential energy surface afterwards. Any other questions? What is the usual time scale within which this entire transformation takes place? Is there a specific time scale? Of the order of a vibrational period. So of the order of 10 to the minus 13 seconds. So uh, it's, it's, it's really, although it's a statistical theory that we use, it's really a dynamical process. So it's a statistical theory describing a, a dynamical process. And the system essentially just moves, moves through uh, almost like a translation over that potential energy surface. But it's of the order of 10 to the minus 13 seconds. Was there a? So, so large molecules. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> depends what you mean by large. Um, but if you, I mean, for example, this system here, OH plus dimethyl ether, is it's not big, but it's not small. Um, and uh, this energy barrier here was tuned in order to get agreement, but it was tuned well within that 1 kcal per mole difference. Uh, um, this is quite a subtle reaction. I mean, it's a, this, is, this is an important reaction, obviously, in, in combustion, because DME is increasingly an important fuel. Uh, and it's quite a subtle reaction because of the fact that this barrier is, is, lo is lower than that of the reactants, but still the rate coefficient increases as the temperature goes up. Uh, but, but you can see that the agreement with, between theory and experiment is remarkably good with a relatively small tuning. Um, we're collaborating with, uh, with a colleague in China who is in, interested in soot formation, and so she's working on really very large molecules. Um, and there, it's very difficult to be, uh, to give accurate predictions 
what you're trying to do really is to understand the sorts of behavior that these systems will have. So, so you would need, very, you need a lot of experiments in order to apply those results directly uh, to, uh, to combustion systems, but it's giving you understanding. It's allowing you to understand various stages in, in soot formation, which you can then put into models in a, in a general sense rather than in a, in a detailed sense. So, so it's, um, uh, it's, it, it, it undoubtedly does depend upon the size of the molecules, but uh, if you're dealing with simple reactions like this, OH plus heptane even, you're going to get reasonably accurate calculations. Well, um, what, you, what you're saying is you, you do the calculation in the forward direction, you do the calculation in the reverse direction, right. and you compare the predictions of the transition state under those conditions. Uh, yeah. Now, um, in a real system, that transition, state, that transition state should be totally independent of which direction you approach it from. Uh, and so if there are differences, then it's an inadequacy in the theory rather than in the reaction, if you see what I mean. So, so that transition state should, must be, in the end, independent of the direction of approach. Yeah, because we, because we, <coughs> we've got to have microscopic reversibility or detailed balance. Of it. We'd better break there and, uh, and have, uh, have coffee, etc. And we'll be back at, at, at 10 o'clock.